Um, I'm going to read my famous scripture that I read before I preach because I need the anointing and this talks about the anointing. Am I on? I am, right? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> what? Okay, let's turn to Luke 4, 18 and 19. This is, I'm, I'm praying this or speaking this over myself and then I'm praying. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Father, we thank You for the anointing uh, <clears throat> that You talk about here. The anointing is Your Spirit. And I thank You, Lord, Your Spirit lives within me and I just yield myself to the Holy Spirit to flow through me, to bless Your people to help us, Lord, to come out of this service more like you, to, to uh, challenge us, to, to encourage us, to put us on the right path. Father God, I just thank you that we'll, we will be changed when we leave this service today because the Holy Spirit moved upon the words that were spoken and, and breathed life into us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have you ever had been reading your Bible and you had a scripture jump out at you off the page when you're reading it? Ever had that? Why, why is that? Do you have any idea why that happens? It's because God is trying to talk to you through that scripture. He's breathing life on that scripture when that happens to you. Maybe you've read it a hundred times, but all of a sudden you see something. Or he deals with you about something that it says in that scripture. Well, when that happens, you need to pay attention to that, to that scripture. Amen? Let's turn to 2 Peter 1. We're going to read a scripture here. that jumped out at me some time ago, and God said, take note of this. And so, I'm going to read it in the, um, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. I'm going to read it in King James, and then I'm going to read it in the Message Bible. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of you have obtained precious faith like the apostles? Yeah. If you're born again, you have obtained that faith. That faith is on the inside of you. God gave to every man the measure of faith. If you're saved, it took faith for you to get saved. He gave you the faith to even get saved. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Well, God gave you that faith so that you could get saved. Well, you have faith. And he's telling these people here <clears throat> that you have the same precious faith that we have through the righteousness of God and our Savior Christ Jesus. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You know, pastor talks about the blessing all the time. Well, that's, part of, that's what this is. His divine power has given us to all things. That's part of the blessing, giving unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But it comes through knowing Him. Amen? It comes through getting acquainted with Him. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How many of you ever have stood on a promise, maybe a promise of healing or prosperity, or we just received tithes and offerings? You're standing on the promises of God when that happens. God gave you those promises so that you can live your life the way he wants you to live them. Amen? So when a, a promise is given, it's a good thing. When he promises you that he'll bless you when you tithe and you give offerings, he means it. So it's a good thing, and it helps us to partake of His divine nature. Do you think God's poor? God's not poor. No, He's rich beyond your wildest dreams. Well, He wants you to partake of some of that, amen? He wants you to have the blessing of not struggling financially, okay? It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God doesn't want you to be unfruitful. He doesn't want you to be barren. Amen? He wants you to be full of God. He wants you to be full of the knowledge of God. He wants you to have a relationship with God. But uh, it's not automatic. You have to develop it. Amen? You have to take time to develop in your relationship with God. You have to take time to develop uh, the things of God in your life. It doesn't just come automatically. They've been planted in you just like faith was planted in you when you got born again. But there's something in there. There's a seed in there. Any of you at garden or, or farmers, you put a seed in the ground. But guess what? You got to make sure it gets water. You might got to make sure it gets sunshine at the right time. Well, the same thing is true with the seeds that God has planted in you. It's up to you to tend to those things and help them develop. It says, but he that lacketh these things is blind. So if you don't have, it says here, what are the things that he's talking about? Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. He says, if you lack these things, you're blind and you cannot see afar off. And you have forgotten that you were purged. He was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if, these, if you do these things, you shall never fall. Ooh, I don't, I don't want to fall. I don't want to fail. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. That's what I'm here to do, is to put you in remembrance of these things that God has said. Amen? So let's read it in the Message Bible because sometimes the King James is hard to understand. But here's the message, the same thing in the message. I, Simon Peter, am a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. I write this to those whose experience with God is as life-changing as ours, all due to our God's straight dealing and intervention of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you many times over as you deepen in your experience with God and Jesus our Master. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, the best invitation we ever received. We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world corrupted by lust. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given, complementing your basic faith with good character spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet, no day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. But without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you, oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. So friends, confirm God's invitation to you, his choice of you. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do this and you'll have your life on firm footing. The streets paved and the way <coughs> wide open into the eternal kingdom of our master and savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That is good stuff. So I have a question. How many of you even knew that verse was in there? Those, those words were in there that God expects us to build from our faith, our initial faith. He expects us to build into our lives and develop the, the, uh, the character of virtue. Virtue means valor, manliness, excellence, or praise. You know, to be a virtuous person is somebody who is excellent in, their, in the things in their life. Amen? How about, did you know that he wants you to increase in your knowledge? or to become fully acquainted and recognizing and acknowledging Him. You know, knowing who God is and knowing God personally are two different things. I mean, I know who George W. Bush is, but I don't know him personally. I've never met him. You know, maybe you have a knowledge of God, but you've never really spent the time to get to know Him. Well, He is saying here, you need to get to know me. Don't just know about me. Don't just know all the ins and outs and the, the, the words to the songs and the, you know, the whatever 
the, the, the little things that we do as Christians, but really get to know who God is personally. How about temperance? Did you know that God wants us to develop in temperance? You know what temperance is? Well, back in the eight, early 1900s, it was abstaining from alcohol. <laughs> Self-control, the temperance union, you ever hear of that? The Women's Christian Temperance Union, they brought about prohibition. You know what prohibition was? Prohibition was when you couldn't have alcohol, you couldn't sell alcohol. Well, that's temperance is self-control. <clears throat> Mastering yourself, mastering your flesh, basically, and having self-control. God wants us to have that. I know a lot of Christians that don't have that. Sometimes I don't have that. How about you? Sometimes you don't have that either? Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> it, this is not to put you in condemnation. This is just to help you say, oh, I need to be pay, paying attention to some things. Because it says at the end here, if you do these things and build upon these things and build these things in your life, you're never going to fall. You're never going to fail. I want to be a Christian who stands before God and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not, well, you forgot to do some things that I told you to do. You just ignored it. <clears throat> no, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to stand before God. And guess what? I believe the Lord's return is very soon and I'm 63. And if the Lord's return is not very soon, I mean, you know, if it's years away, uh, I've lived a good portion of my life already. You know, I don't want to stand before God and be saying, oh, well, sorry, I didn't know that. Because it says that he, he expects us to be diligent in finding these things out. Okay, the next, the next thing that he wants us to develop is perseverance or patience. What do you think patience is? Can anybody tell me what patience is? Waiting joyfully. Cheerful endurance. How many of you are cheerful while you're waiting? <laughs> I would say, unfortunately, too many of us aren't. <laughs> the Bible calls it long-suffering. While you're suffering long, you're con while you're suffering for a long time, you're, uh, you're kind. Hallelujah. <laughs> you're kind and, and while you're suffering. So even though you are waiting for something or you're going through something, you don't change. You are still as kind, you are still as loving, you are still as friendly as you were before you started going through this thing. Amen? Well, that is something that needs to, to develop in us because another scripture, which I didn't look it up, it says, through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. So if you want to inherit the promise of healing, it's going to take faith and patience for you to walk through whatever trial you're going through. You know, Randy... Uh, Randy back there, he had to, with faith and patience, walk through that trial of cancer that he had, didn't you, Randy? Yeah, it didn't look too good a couple of times, did it? It looked pretty bad. He got pretty skinny. He was like a skeleton. But guess what? We contended, he contended for what God had promised, which was healing. Sandy contended. This church contended. We prayed for him, you know, as his, as, as his uh, fellow believers in this church. We contended with him, but we patiently waited for that thing to manifest. Well, <clears throat> that's what patience, we're, we're to be developing in patience. And sometimes we go through things that develop it. Not because uh, God wants to uh, do something terrible to us, but life is out there. Sin is out there. Sickness and disease is out there. And sometimes it attaches itself to a Christian and they have to stand against that thing with the word of God, with the promises of God, with the strength of these virtues in their life to help them to get through to the other side. Amen? Godliness. Another thing that we're supposed to be developing is godliness, which is piety, holiness, and godlikeness. Uh, I know some Christians that the way they talk, you could not really tell that they were a Christian. They use about as much, bad, or they call themselves Christians, but they use about as much negativity and bad language as the world does. Well, God says there, there should be a, a difference in us. People should be able to tell that we're different, that we're holy, which what does holy mean? Set apart unto God, that we have set ourselves apart unto God so that we come out of the world. We don't look like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't talk like the world. Amen? It doesn't mean that we have to wear, you know, have our hair piled up on top of our head, wear dresses, no pants, not, I mean, you, if you want to do that, that's fine. 
but not that kind, but just in our attitudes and our actions. Amen? <clears throat> so, those, four, those first faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, and godliness, those all refer to our relationship with God. That all has to do with our relationship with God. Now, the next two that that scripture talks about is brotherly kindness and love or charity. Well, those two have to do with our relationship with men. Brotherly kindness is uh, brotherly love or fraternal affection, a fervent, practical caring for others. How many others do you care for? <clears throat> you know, do you show brotherly kindness to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or you just ignore it when they're going through something? Hopefully you show some brotherly, uh, some brotherly kindness. But you know what? If you haven't developed your relationship with God, those first one, two, three, four, five, six, those, fir those first six uh, attributes, then brotherly kindness is not going to flow out of you. You're not going to give two hoots about your brother or sister in Christ. You're just going to say, well, well, hope they get through that. You know, but you, you don't care enough to even do anything for them or help them in any way. Well, and then the last one is love or charity. And that word is agape, and it's the God kind of love, and it is a sacrificial kind of love towards other people. Maybe it's your mom or your dad. Maybe it's your husband or your wife, your kids. Maybe it's a, a co-worker or somebody else. Maybe it's a boss or somebody that you don't even know. But it is a love that gives so sacrificially that it hurts. You know, uh, John 3.16 talks about, what does John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was a sacrificial kind of love. That's the same kind of love we're talking about. A love that sacrifices itself for the sake of others. <clears throat> I want to be that kind of person, don't you? Want to be that kind of person that you would sacrifice for someone else? And that would show the person that you really do have God on the inside of you. And it would speak to that person and it would draw them to the God that you say you serve. You know, it talks about um, God is love and love is of God. So if you want to manifest to people how God is, show them this brotherly kindness and this love. But you can't do it if you don't know the one who is love. If you don't know God the Father who is love or you don't have a close relationship with him, well, how do you get that relationship? You get that relationship by coming to church, hearing the word preached, allowing that word to change you from the inside out, taking your own personal time and spending time taking a scripture, reading a, reading a Bible verse or getting a, a um, devotional and reading a devotional every day that encourages you and builds you up and, and, and helps you to come closer to God. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That's before the next uh, part of that verse says, resist the devil and he will flee. Well, we like to resist the devil, don't we? But until you have drawn nigh to God, you don't have the power or the wherewithal or the patience or the knowledge to know how to resist him until you come into God's presence and spend time with him. <clears throat> it's a great thing to spend time with God. It's a great thing to spend time reading the Bible. I, I get energized. I don't know about you guys, but when I uh, get my Bible out and read my Bible, I get energized spiritually because God says that his words are spirit and they are life. And it's a supernatural kind of life that lives on the inside of us, that he wants to nourish. And, and Jesus said that his word cleansed, his, um, cleansed the, the uh, disciples. He talked about his words, that they were clean through his word, the words that he had spoken. So this word here is what God has spoken to mankind that has been written down. <clears throat> and it is a supernatural thing. Uh, turn over to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, uh, we're going to start with verse 7. It says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he, the Lord, will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts and your thoughts, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it to bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before singing before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Why is that? Because you're being changed by the word of God. Amen. And the word of God is coming to pass in your life because it's getting planted into your heart and it's changing you from the inside out. Yeah, that is. Thank you, Father. Amen. So if you have a problem in your life, go to the word of God. If you need healing, Look up the healing scriptures. God says that his word that he has spoken, it won't return into him void. So you know how pastor talks about you got to say it? When you get that down and you read it, you meditate on it. In other words, you think about it, you mutter it, you kind of tr try to memorize it, you memorize it, you say it over and over to yourself. What happens? It's getting planted deeper and deeper into your heart and it's growing roots. And then when it gets in there so much, that it starts coming out your mouth, it's going to change your external situation. Amen? That's why pastor says, watch your words. Watch what comes out of your mouth because it does affect. If God could create the whole world by what he said, what are you creating in your life by what you say? But that all goes back to your relationship with God and these, these attributes that you have uh, uh, helped to uh, nurture and to grow in. Because when I, when I read that, when I, I don't remember when it was. It wasn't that long ago. When I read that, I'm like, Lord, I'm not sure that I've developed in these some of these things as much as I should have. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me. Help me. I want to be that person that doesn't ever fail or fail you. Because, uh, you know, God does expect us to grow. He doesn't want us to be stagnant. He doesn't want us to be immature Christians. He wants us to be mature Christians that he can trust with things like laying hands on the sick over there in, uh, let's turn over there, <clears throat> Mark. Mark 16. These are the kind of things God wants to trust you with. Mark 16, 17, and 18, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Those are the kind of things God wants you to be doing. You know, not just uh, once in your lifetime, but on a regular basis. Amen? Well, if you haven't developed that relationship and that assurance of your relationship with the Lord, you're going to be afraid to step out and ask somebody. I mean, I, the other day I had a guy come in. He, has, he started with kidney cancer. It spread to his bones. I mean, you know, he does not have a good prognosis. He came in and got a haircut, and I've only cut his hair one other time. And I said, this may seem really weird to you, coming to a hairdresser, and they ask you if I can pray for you. But I said, I believe, I believe, you know, in the power of prayer. And he said, sure. Well, I laid my hands on him, and I prayed for him. <clears throat> you know, I don't know how well he received it, but he was, he was like, sure, go ahead, pray, pray for me. Well, I'm believing God for him to be healed, for that cancer to be driven out of his body. Amen? I don't care where, how far it is. I'm, I'm trying to act on what the Word says. I'm trying to do what God said to do. So don't be condemned if you haven't gotten there yet. But just know that there are things that you can do to help you get there. And that is take time with the Father and ask him to develop these things within you. Turn over to Galatians 5. These things in 2 Peter are very similar to what the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit are. <clears throat> and where does fruit come from? Anybody got an answer to that? Tell me where you think fruit comes from. What? Fruit comes from a seed. Oh, you're good, Galen. Wow. Fruit comes from a seed. <clears throat> and it, it, it has to have the right conditions, right? 
Well, guess what? You have the seed of these fruits of the Spirit on the inside of you. You have the seed of these virtues that I just talked about from 2 Peter within you. You just have to yield to God and let Him develop them in you. Galatians 5, 21 and 22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, which is, it, before that, well, actually it's 22 and 23, sorry. Uh, the fruit of the flesh is from 19 to 21. Look at some of those and see if any of those apply to you. If they do, uh, maybe you need to uh, change some things in your life because we don't want the fruit of the flesh in our body, in, our, in ourselves, in our lives. It says in 22 and 23, <clears throat> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Some of the, don't some of those look familiar to what was in 2 Peter? Yeah, they do. Against such there, there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another or envying one another. So God says that if you are Christ, then these uh, fruits of the Spirit should be in your life, and the fruits of the flesh should have been crucified. So none of us are perfect. All some of this stuff, strife, hatred, rises up within us, but we have to squelch it. And how do we do that? We, go, we squelch it by turning to God, repenting, submitting ourselves to God, allowing His Word to cleanse us. Um, turn over to um, 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Are you getting anything out of this? I don't want you to be I don't want you to be condemned. I want you to be inspired to press into God farther. Oh, wrong direction. Um, 2 Thessalonians <clears throat> 2 Cuz none of us are perfect. We've all messed up. We we all lack in some areas. Some of us more than others, but you know. <laughs> Some areas were really good. Maybe we're really patient people, or maybe we're really kind people, but, you know, maybe we don't have a temperance. Maybe we eat too much, or maybe we drink too much, or whatever. <clears throat> or maybe we do something else too much. But, you know, we can develop in all of these things. Okay, so 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, 1 through 3, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him, which is coming soon, the rapture of the church, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled. Am I in the right place? No, I'm not sure this is the right scripture. Uh, Neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. Nope, this is not the same. This is not the right scripture. Let me go to First Thessalonians and see if that's it. I looked it up. <laughs> nope, that's not it. Okay, well, we'll just skip that. I'm going to look real quick at another scripture here. See, I'm not perfect. I mess up. No, nope, I don't know what scripture it was I was thinking of. But anyway, so... <clears throat> The fruit of the Spirit, it's something that should be in us. These virtues in Second Peter, it's something that should be in us. You know that, uh, why wouldn't we, uh, to become effective and productive as a Christian, should be, these qualities have to be growing in our lives. Otherwise, we, don't, we become stagnant and we don't produce anything. We don't advance spiritually. Have any of you ever felt stagnant spiritually? Probably everybody's hand could go up, should go up if they haven't. Well, why is that? Probably because we get sidetracked with other things, and uh, we don't. We're not pressing into God like we should. You know, I re even remember uh, there's a guy. He's been here before, Billy Miller. He's an evangelist. I heard him the oh, a couple of months ago. He said, you know, there came a place, time in my life where I got bored with the Word of God, reading the Word of God. I'm like, what, Billy Miller? He's a very strong evangelist. I'm like, he got bored with that. Helped me. That helps me a lot to hear somebody, mighty man of God, say he got bored reading the Bible. And, and, and I've heard other people, I heard Gloria Copeland once say, you know, she noticed that her affection and her, her desire for God began to wane. And so she started uh, 
checking up on herself. Well, sometimes these things happen. We get distracted by things, and our love relationship with the Lord suffers. And so uh, if that's happened to you, don't despair. It's okay. It happens to everybody at some point in their life. Just make sure that you're pressing through that onto a fuller relationship with God. Thir- turn to 3 John 2. This is one we use a lot, even during offering, but... 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. God wants your soul to prosper. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotion. In other words, he doesn't, well, God doesn't want us to stay stagnant. He wants us to be always growing, ever increasing. We should be growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> You know, um, what, what do you think about Abraham? You remember Abraham, the father of our faith? What happened to him? He had to press into his relationship with God. God promised him a son by his wife, Sarah. He was 99 years old before that promise came to pass. God promised him that at the age of 75. They tried to have a children all their married life. I don't know how old they were when they got married, but they tried to have children. Couldn't do it. Nothing worked, Okay. But he stood faithful, he pressed into God, and guess what? He eventually, he waited patiently for those promises to come to pass, and eventually they did come to pass. He got sidetracked, though. You remember that? You remember the story? His wife said, well, I can't have babies, so why don't you take this concubine of mine, this handmaiden, and why don't you have relations with her, and she can have a baby. Well, that's where we get the problems with the Arabs and the Jews is from that little, that little uh, man trying to fix their own problem. That's what's happening over in the Middle East, why the Jews hate the Arabs and the Arabs hate the Jews. Because if Abraham took his wife's handmaiden and had sex with her and they had a baby called Ishmael. Well, finally, <clears throat> they got it right and they had Isaac. And the Isaac's name means laughter. She was 90 years old. He was 99. She named her son Laughter. Because it made her laugh when God told her that she was going to have a baby at 90 years of age. Ed, how old are you? 88. You're 88, Ed. You're 88. (laughs) When were you born? You were born in 34. 1934, I think. Yeah, so you're 88. 36? Oh, whatever. What? He's in his 80s, okay? <laughs> can you imagine Ed, Ed having a baby? I said, can you, can you imagine Ed fathering a child at this age? Why not? <laughs> That's the ticket, Ed. That's it. We like that. That's the spirit of faith, okay? <laughs> well, and Abraham, after Sarah, uh, he lived on and had more kids. He had more wives and more kids after that. So even though he hadn't been able to have children up to 99 years of age, he finally had one, but he stood firm. Why? Because he developed his relationship with God and he trusted God and he went on. Well, God wants us all to grow in our relationship with him. But there are things that could keep us from, from this happening in our life. What could be one thing? Distractions. We get distracted. Remember the parable of the sower? where it says the seed was sown on these different grounds. And uh, in Mark, I'm going to turn over there. It talks about things that can uh, stop the word of God or can stop our spiritual life from, from growing. <clears throat> it's Mark 4. And it says, that's 3, that's 9, 4. The sower sows the word. So he talked about the, sow, the, sow, the seed being sown on different ground. And these are, the wor- so, these are they which are sown by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their heart. Sometimes you don't produce because Satan came and lied to you and stole the word out of your heart. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they heard the word immediately received it with gladness and having no root in themselves and so endure 
But for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Something happened you didn't like, and, and uh, the devil stole that seed of the word out of your heart. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, or worry, and the deceitfulness of riches, or you're, you're working so hard to make a living that you forget about God, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So the word may have been planted in your heart. You may have become a Christian, but the, the everyday affairs of life have got you so busy that you don't have time for God. You forgot where your Bible even is. You don't know. You, you haven't read it in months, maybe years. Well, it says here that these are they which are, uh, but there are some that are sown on good ground that produce something. Those are the ones that aren't distracted. <clears throat> by the deceitfulness of riches or the lust of other things. So that is something that can stop you from producing. Unforgiveness is another thing that can stop you from producing because if you have aught in your heart towards someone, guess what? You're not going to have a good relationship with God. And it takes your relationship with God being strong in order for you to produce fruit because the fruit of the Spirit comes as a result of being connected to His Spirit and fellowshipping with Him. Amen? Another thing that could hinder your producing fruit is unbelief. Turn to Hebrews 3. <clears throat> Do you remember the children of Israel? Remember that? God brought them out of Egypt. They were enslaved to Pharaoh and, you know, he was beating them and all this kind of stuff. And Moses came along and brought them out. They were supposed to go into the promised land. They wandered for how long out in the desert? Do you remember? Forty years. It took, it was like they said, 11 day journey on foot. It took them 40 years to get there. It's like a lot of them died in the wilderness. The ones that were over, uh, what, 40 died in the wilderness. Why? Because <clears throat> they were doing things their way, not God's way. It says, Okay, Hebrews 3, it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my oath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You know, when unbelief comes in, it makes you depart from God because to be connected to God, you have to believe Him. You have to have faith. You have to have trust. Well, when you don't have that, you are departing from God. And we're going to keep on reading down here. It says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today. That's what I'm doing. I'm exhorting you. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all, that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief will keep you from entering into the fullness of all that God has for you because you're so distracted by everything going on around you that you've gotten, hard, you've gotten hardened in your heart. Any of you ever gotten hard-hearted about something? About someone? <clears throat> well, it'll keep you from enjoying things. God talks about it in the Old Testament. He taught, t said they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted. And they, it caused them problems over and over and over again. God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to be pliable in His hands. He wants us to have a, a vibrant, alive relationship with Him. <clears throat> but we can't do it if we're letting this stuff in. The unbelief, the unforgiveness, the distractions, the sin, even pride. Turn to Proverbs 16. Maybe sometimes somebody's done something to us or said something to us and it was wrong. It was wrong. What they did was wrong. But we've gotten so prideful about, well, we were right and they were wrong that we are, uh, we're wrong. 
Maybe what they did was wrong, but you're not forgiving them or staying in pride and saying, well, I was right and they were wrong and I'm not going to bend and they blah, blah, blah. It says here that pride is bad. Here's why. Pride is bad. Uh, verse 17, it says, The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Did you know that pride is what actually got Satan kicked out of heaven? Did you know that? That was the sin of Satan. That the, the great archangel Lucifer was this beautiful being that had music coming out of his parts. I'm not sure what all the, what all the parts were. But anyway, and he got the big head and saw people, people worshiping God. And he said, you know what? I'm prettier than that. I, got, I sound better than that. I think I should be worshipped. Turn over to Isaiah 14. And when you don't yield to God, you're being just like Satan. You're saying, I'm bigger than God. I don't need him. I don't need, to, I don't need to forgive them. I don't need to humble myself before God. I can do this on my own, and they owe me an apology or whatever it is. Uh, 2, 12, 14, 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and that did shake kingdoms? It's like... Who, when we see Satan, we're going to say, what? That little guy? That little puny thing? But he fell. He got kicked out of heaven. It says pride goes before destruction because of his pride. How many of you have let pride come in? That you don't go and make something right with someone. Maybe that hurts you or harms you. Or that does you wrong on a regular basis. Pride will keep you from uh, getting along with that person. Pride will keep you saying, well, they shouldn't treat me like that. They should treat me like this. Well, <clears throat> forgive them and go on. You be right. You do the right thing. You humble yourself before God because it says God will exalt you if you will humble yourself. Turn to James 4. <clears throat> We're almost done. Because I want to be a fully developed Christian. I don't want to get to heaven and find out that I'm just this lame little weakling that doesn't have any rewards. You know, because when you get to you get saved, you get saved by the blood of Jesus. You know, and there's uh, that that's that's what saves you is the blood of Jesus. But when you get to heaven, you're not going to get any rewards if you haven't done and developed the way God told you to de be developed. You may get into heaven, but <clears throat> it's not going to be, you'll have nothing to worship the Lord with because God gives us rewards and then we'll go before the Lord and we will throw our rewards down at his feet and worship him with them. Amen. But, and also your rewards de uh, depend your uh, position in the rest of eternity. And that's, cons that is, uh, uh, um, uh, According to how you've been here on the earth. Have you been that kind, loving, having brotherly kindness, have, being virtuous and temperate and patient? Have you been that kind of a person? Because you're going to be rewarded for those things. It's not just, well, they, I'm not going to do that because they're going to walk all over me if that, I'm that kind of person. Well, wait till you get to heaven and see what reward you have waiting for you because you were that kind of a person on earth. Jesus turned his, let people slap him and kick him and spit on him and pull his beard out and beat him and thrash him to, to a pulp. And he, he, he loved those people. He turned, he didn't, he didn't uh, hold unforgiveness against them. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's, how we're, that's the Lord and Savior that we're supposed to be emulating. <clears throat> that when people do us wrong, we don't hold it against them. It may not be easy. Some people may get on your last good nerve, but it's still what we're supposed to do.
And I know when I say that, you somebody's somebody's picture of somebody somebody or their face or their name popped into your head when I said that. Well, those people, that's why we need these characters developed in us so we can treat them like God wants us to treat them. It says here, uh, James 4, 6, it says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Do you want God to resist you? If things are hard in your life, maybe it's because God's resisting you because you're proud. It says here, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So God wants us to submit to him so that we have the, the power and the strength to resist the devil so that he will flee from us. <clears throat> well, I don't want the devil to have any part of my life, so I want to get rid of this stuff that gives him something to attach himself to. You know, um, when Jesus was on the earth, they said that, uh, um, I forget, I think it's in John, said they could find nothing in him. They could find, the devil couldn't find anything to attach to Jesus. Jesus had to lay his life down because Jesus didn't have any sin. He didn't have any unforgiveness. He didn't have any bitterness. He didn't have any resentment. He didn't have any kind of an attitude towards anyone. So the devil couldn't cling to him. Well, if you have those things in you, the devil can cling to you. That's why God wants you to get rid of them because he doesn't want you to give Satan a place to attach himself to you. Amen? So it's for your own good that you develop these things in your life. It's for your own good that you get rid of the, the bad and, and develop the godly characters. So what's the remedy for all of this stuff? Repentance, returning to God, <clears throat> returning to the Word of God, returning to taking priority, making the time in the Bible, reading your Bible every day a priority in your life, uh, time, uh, to return to uh, the Lord by taking a few minutes every day or a lot of minutes every day, uh, praying and talking to your Father. You can't develop a relationship without conversation. If you never converse with God through prayer, you can't develop that relationship. If you never look at what He says and you say, well, He doesn't talk back to me. Yes, He does. Get out your Bible. He talks to you if you'll read it. This is how God talks to you a lot of times is through the scriptures. That's why I said, remember at the beginning I said, have you ever read a scripture that jumped out at you? It's because God's talking to you through that scripture. <clears throat> he wants you to get something that he's saying in that scripture. So that's how God talks to us most of the time is through here. Other times you'll feel something down inside here, scratching around, or you, you'll feel an inkling down in here. And that's the still small voice of the Lord that he will talk to you. So... Uh, David said, I, I didn't look this up, but he says, Your word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you as you spend time in the word and put it down in your heart and, and, and draw an eye unto God. It says that that word will help to keep you from sinning. It'll keep you from getting that attitude. It'll keep you from getting that, that, bad, uh, that, that bad attitude towards somebody. <clears throat> so... Like it says in 2 Peter, when we develop these things, it says we'll never fall. We will never fall. And I read that to you before. I'm going to read you the 8 through 10 here. Hang on. Maybe if I can find it. So we're going back to this. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. Remember the, that stuff's been planted in you. Complimenting your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. With these active qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet, no day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you. Oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. So, friends, confirm God's invitation to you, His choice of you. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do this, and you'll have your life on a firm footing. The streets paved in the way wide open into the eternal kingdom of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. So right now, you know, <clears throat> I just want to give an altar call. I think we need to just, if there's something that has been bugging us something that we when i was speaking the holy spirit was saying 
You know, you need to get that right. You guys can just play some music up there if you want to. Uh, you know, I'm going to come down here and, and at the altar. Just spend a couple of minutes here at the altar letting God minister to your hearts. Maybe you need to repent of something. Maybe you need to lay something down. Maybe you need to lay a relationship down, a, an attitude down, <clears throat> something. Somebody has hurt you. Maybe they haven't hurt you. Maybe you've hurt them and you just want to get it right with God. You know, I it, open up the, the altar here. You can stand. You can sit in the front pew. You can kneel at the altar. But I think we need to take time to make sure that we're right with God and that if we haven't been doing these things that I encouraged you to do today, that we'll make a decision today to put God first, to put his word first, to put time with him first, to allow him to develop these characters within us so that when we stand before him, we can hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen.